A new computing era has definitively begun. The platform shift to accelerated computing, significantly speeding up machine learning and enabling the ability to deal with very large data sets, has assisted the development of generative artificial intelligence, or AI, offering human-like computing performance. This is driving significant investment in new, highly practical enterprise applications, the development of which has already become a corporate imperative globally. As we look forward, it is becoming ever clearer that AI can deliver a significant productivity boost across a multitude of industries. And it is for this reason why its potential is often compared with prior general purpose technologies, such as the development of the personal computer, the introduction of the internet and smartphone adoption, all from which very significant new markets were developed. In this episode, we explore the impact of AI and the profound impact it is having as it converges with several other technology platforms. We discuss this in addition to a number of other topical issues impacting markets with Kathy Wood from ARK Invest. Hello and welcome to the Investor Insights podcast hosted by Killick & Co. My name is Gordon Smith, and in each episode, I'll be interviewing portfolio managers from across the investment industry to gain from their expertise in the specialist areas in which they invest and to question them on topical issues. You can access the full series of interviews via the playlist on the Killick & Co. YouTube channel. We hope you're enjoying the discussion so far, and you can get in contact with us about any of the topics discussed via our email address, Investor Insights at Killick.com. Killick & Co is an independently owned wealth manager which opened its first office in 1989 and provides services to help families save, plan and invest. And you can find more details on the unique ways in which we do that at our website, Killick.com. In this episode, we were joined by Kathy Wood, founder and CEO of ARK Invest, the Florida headquartered asset manager with over $29 billion of assets under management. Kathy has over 40 years of investment experience, including an 18 year period at Jemison Associates as an economist, portfolio manager, and analyst, and a 12 year tenure as CIO of Global Thematic Strategies at Alliance Bernstein. Kathy founded ARK Invest in 2014 with the primary aim of investing in disruptive innovation largely within public equity markets, and has built an extensive team of specialist analysts organised by innovation themes. ARC also employs a unique open research approach with the aim of creating a more transparent investment process, but also one which drives important feedback from industry experts. ARC Invest's acquisition of the RISE ETF business the European thematic and sustainability focused ETF provider in September last year, enabled the company to launch a range of previously only US listed active ETF strategies onto European markets, including the London market. We were delighted to host Cathy in our London Mayfair head office for this episode, and our conversation covers a wide range of topics with this hugely influential an experienced investor. Good morning, Kathy. H- how are you doing today? I'm great, Gordon. How are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Um, so it's actually a, a, a slightly different setup for us today. We uh, we've actually got you here in in person in the office, which is uh, which is really nice. We usually do, we're doing this over Zoom. We've had people dial in from from Vietnam and the Caribbean, but it's lovely to have have you here in person. Um, but our our standard opening question is always the same. And it's one that kind of attempts to get to know you a little bit better and a bit of an insight into your typical working week or what you've been working on recently. So I wondered if there was um, an anecdote maybe from a, a recent meeting you've had or a research trip or, or, or even just a book or article that you've, that, you've, uh, that you've read recently that you could share. Sure. Well, um, first I'll say, uh, while you're normally on Zoom, this is probably one of the most beautiful offices I've ever, I've ever been in. Um, yeah, so it's been earning season. And so I can reflect on the many, many callbacks with managements, management teams that we've had. Uh, AI, which is all the rage, uh, is, is upending a lot of business decisions now. 
And what we're finding as we go through one call back after the other, it doesn't matter what kind of company, um, there's a little bit of a, a, a stall or a freeze taking place because, uh, and, and it's a function of confusion. Um, and so what's happening, I think, is corporations are saying, you know, this is a big deal. This uh, is going to have ramifications for our competitive standing in the world. We've got to figure this out. Uh, and it's the strategic decision makers are saying, we can't let this happen one division at a time. You know, sure, they can harness tools, productivity tools, but we've got to do a rethink here. And so uh, it harkens back to what happened in the early days of the internet. I remember very well back then as companies were forced to buy routers and switches and so forth, they held back and said, wait a minute, this is important. So I think that's something many people uh, don't understand yet. And we have the luxury of speaking to so many management teams. We will have a call back with every management team in our portfolio, the various portfolios. So uh, that's a luxury. Yeah, yeah, certainly is. They're the key focus of most uh, earning statements for sure. You know. um, I wondered, as a kind of first proper question, we, we could maybe touch on the macro. It has been a period where particularly those kind of growth or those kind of disruptive businesses have continued to be influenced by the, the kind of macro backdrop and perhaps more more so than than usual. And I, I wonder, I know it's a, a huge topic, whether you could kind of briefly summarise your your kind of macro view and, and particularly in, in relation to inflation at the moment. I know you've had some, some strong views on the inflation outlook. Sure. Um, yes. Well, uh, we believe that headline numbers in the U.S. Uh, are not telling the story. And uh, there has been a rolling recession uh, in the U.S., but I think it's throughout the world. Um, in the U.S., housing numbers are still down anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, depending upon the region. Uh, auto sales are subpar. Commercial real estate office, I think everyone knows, um, certainly here in London as well. Uh, and and I think many people do not understand that multifamily is now facing pressures. Uh, and finally, we think the consumer will capitulate. We think the unemployment rate uh, will go up now that companies are facing real margin pressure. Uh, they're losing pricing power. The stickiness of inflation that we've seen in the last, I'd say, six to nine months is companies looking at unit growth, seeing it unwind here, either slow down dramatically or actually fall. A lot of companies are seeing negative revenue growth or falling revenues. Uh, in response, they've tried to get pricing to protect margins. That's not working either. The consumer is on strike. And uh, we believe uh, we're going to see, and we're hearing a lot about uh, deflation already, certainly on the good side, we're hearing Walmart, Costco, Target, all of the big companies out there saying we're going to um, cut prices on 5,000 or however many items. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that will show through in the, in the broad-based inflation gauges. The other thing is real-time rents. They're actually starting to fall in some regions in the U.S., and we do think that's going to be a source of significant pressure uh, because of the overbuilding in uh, multifamily. Finally, um, I, don't, I don't think that any of us really understand how overwhelming the, the debt is in China and how much deflation uh, China is exporting. We're beginning to hear this. It's hitting political circles in the form of electric vehicles and solar and so forth, but it's much, uh, much beyond that. So uh, we actually think prices will fall. Uh, and sure, it's taken longer than we expected, but the anecdotes, and as I said, we listen to a lot of company calls, we talk to a lot of management teams, and they're losing pricing power. Yeah, and I think the China point's a really, a really interesting one. That's, I mean, it's, it has such a big impact on, on the global economy. Yes, and, and just one more thing. Um, interest rates, of course, have hurt long-duration strategies. Long bonds, not the least of them, right? Uh, in, especially in 21, at the width of higher interest rates, 22, the reality of higher interest rates, 23 was a great year for us because of the width of falling interest rates. And I think this year will be the reality. We've gone through a jog here where 
the market went from expecting six rate cuts this year in the U.S. to no rate cuts, and now uh, the number is increasing again. So I think that will prove beneficial for our strategy and other long duration strategies. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think that, that lays a kind of framework for the rest of the conversation well, so thank you. So our, our produce this brilliant document, The Big Ideas 2024, and I think it was a, a, a few months ago, certainly early on in the year. And I think one of the, the, the key takeaways from that was this concept of technological convergence. And so I wondered if you could explain um, what, what you mean by that term, and if it's possible, just give some examples of how you see that kind of technological wave occurring. Sure. Um, well, we have centered our research around five major platforms. So robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and multi-omic sequencing in the life science space. Um, and involved in those five platforms are 14 different technologies. Uh, and what we're seeing today is the convergence among those technologies. Um, two of the best examples uh, are autonomous taxi networks, robo-taxis. So that's the convergence of three of the platforms. Robotics, so autonomous vehicles are robots. Uh, energy storage, they will be electric. Total cost of ownership much lower there than gas-powered. And uh, artificial intelligence, they'll be powered by AI. And this is going to be a winner-take-most opportunity region by region. Um, so, uh, of course, Tesla, we think, is in the pole position in the U.S. Um, another convergence, and, and the reason convergence is so important, and if I can bring it to life a little bit for you, um, so each one of the 14 technologies is following an S-curve. Um, and, and that means it starts out somewhat slowly and then all at once, right? Um, well, what we have with those three uh, um, platforms converging is three S-curves converging. So you're ha they're feeding one another. And so we believe that the entire ecosystem associated with autonomous taxi platforms is going to be an eight to $10 trillion revenue business in the next five to 10 years. Uh, from essentially nothing now. So, you know, when you think the global economy is $130 trillion, it's going to move the needle and completely transform transportation. So that's one. The second is in the multiomic sequencing space. So here we have uh, multiomic sequencing. And what that means is it's not just DNA sequencing, it's RNA, it's proteins, methylation, epigenetics. It's very complicated. Um, that convergence with artificial intelligence, and that's a, a very important uh, thing that I'm saying there, because AI is the biggest catalyst to all of the convergence taking place. So um, multiomic sequencing, AI, and CRISPR gene editing uh, is already curing disease. What's interesting about this bear market and long-duration strategies, this is not like the late 90s where uh, you know, a hope and a prayer, and hopefully eyeballs 10 years from now got us this valuation. This is CRISPR Therapeutics, which is headquartered in Switzerland, uh, already has approval in the U.S., in the U.K., in Europe for um, uh, beta thalassemia and, uh, and sickle cell disease, curing those with uh, CRISPR gene editing. So that's the convergence of three, or among three, of our technologies. And I think the reason it has not been appreciated in the market is, again, slowly, slowly, then all at once. So these therapies are going to cost $2 million. They're, very, they're rare diseases. They've been incurable. The tr symptoms, symptoms couldn't even be treated. So how are we going to pay for this? Well, I think it's, uh, it's lifetime value. Every year, a person does not show any manifestation of these diseases, the insurance companies will pay. Oh, I, I wondered if we could maybe dive even, even further into the, the genomics or the multi-omic sequencing um, area, because it is perhaps one of the, the five, those five technological platforms that you, the, that you just referred to, perhaps one of those that is slightly less talked about in, in the kind of general financial world or, or financial kind of commentary. Could, could you maybe talk, talk through some more examples of just what 
why you're excited about this space and it is one of those areas that you have a dedicated dedicated fund dedicated platform absolutely. for absolutely uh, and i'll just finish on crispr therapeutics which is the company yeah. uh that that developed those therapies um the first person in the beta thalassemia um uh, trial the very first one pro- nearly four years ago now uh he had his genome edited once um he, on average, over a year's time, used to go into the uh, hospital on an emergency basis 17 times per year for blood transfusions. In the last almost four years now, he has not had one. And it was just one treatment. Think about that. You're not hearing about this, um, which I, I kind of like. It just tells us that this uh, particular theme is inefficiently priced. If I had told you in any other environment that we then we're, we've experienced with interest rates, uh, shocking long duration assets, uh, this would we would be talking a lot about this. And um, you know, even in the UK, the UK has been very interesting. Um, one of your children's hospitals here. There, there's a f- famous young woman. Uh, she's probably thirteen or fourteen now. Alyssa, uh, in. 2022, when we were in the worst part of the bear market, uh, she was on her deathbed uh, going into hospice May of 22. Uh, Hail Mary Pass base editing, which is another kind of uh, gene editing, um, which Beam Therapeutics, another uh, name in our portfolios, evolved and has the patents for. Um, May, she got one treatment. She's cancer free now. And it's it's astonishing. And uh, so what this theme is all about is um, not only these sorts of breakthrough therapies, which are cures. And, you know, our compliance team says, well, you can't say cures because maybe they're not, you know, we're still in trouble. These are cures. You talk to any person who's uh, going through hell and then back, uh, they are cures. But it's also about uh, molecular diagnostic testing. Uh, and so we have names in the portfolio. Exact Sciences has, has been one of them. Uh, Natera is another. Uh, here, we believe these companies are going to be able to diagnose cancer in stage one with blood tests, so liquid biopsies. Uh, and just think about that. If you diagnose a cancer in stage one, the odds for living more than five years go up dramatically into the 75% plus range. If a cancer has metastasized, uh, that probability collapses into, you know, I know it's less than 20% and, and often much less if you're talking about pancreatic cancer. So molecular diagnostic testing is going to, we believe, develop a premium valuation the interesting inefficiency here is testing, lab testing, as we know it today, is commoditized. So whenever analysts or portfolio managers hear uh, lab tests, they think commoditization, that is absolutely wrong in, in this new world. I wonder if we can maybe move back to kind of broader broader markets, broader, broader technology. And it has been a, a pretty extended period which has generally favoured a pretty narrow group of, 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 of mega cap stocks within the market. I, I wondered your kind of take on that and what you think might be the catalyst for a kind of return of outperformance of smaller technology-enabled businesses. Well, it's been interesting to watch algorithms at work in this market because as interest rates went up, and this was a 24-fold increase in interest rates, that has never happened in history. Uh, As that was happening and was such a shock to the system, uh, long duration assets were um, experienced the biggest hit. Uh, Now, higher interest rates do not always do that to long duration assets. One of our best years ever at ARC was 2017 when interest rates were going up all year round. But because interest rates are all anyone can think about, and especially algorithms, to the extent they think, um, uh, we do believe that the other side of interest rates going down is going to favor by far long duration assets. If you look at the concentration in the market, you have to go by some measures, 
you have to go back to the Great Depression to see more concentration. Goldman did a study on this. Um, and, and what you saw was from 29 through 1929 through 1932, huge concentration towards the highest market cap stocks. They were the mass, most cash rich. They were going to survive whatever this depression was going to do to the world. Uh, we have just seen uh, an explosion in concentration higher than that for the same reason. Those companies with cash uh, uh, are being rewarded, and there are fewer and fewer of them over time. The Mag 7 went to the Mag 6 when they dropped Tesla out. I was happy, by the way, they dropped Tesla out. Uh, and we're fewer and fewer are, are benefiting these days. When interest rates come down, what I believe we'll see is the same thing we saw after that moment in the Great Depression. Uh, and that was a broadening out of the market so that maybe the large cap stocks don't go down, but they don't go up anywhere as much as the, the smaller cap stocks. Now, I want to make sure that you understand our portfolios are all cap. Uh, and so they're large and mega, more than half, but only 10, 11 percent in the mega category. So we're not in those mag six. We're, we're a highly differentiated source of exposure to truly disruptive innovation. Uh, and I think we play a role in protecting portfolios ultimately against the disruption that is going to disintermediate or even destroy companies in the traditional world order. So we serve a very distinct purpose and we, and we like people to understand that. The last thing is, I have never seen a valuation gap between our names and the S&P 500 as narrow as it is today. We adjust for stock-based compensation. Our uh, multiple today on an enterprise value to EBITDA point of view is 25 times and the S&P is at 20 times. Never happened before. So if you give us a five-year investment time horizon, which is our investment time horizon, I will tell you we are running deep value portfolios. And just to put an exclamation point on that, normally in our discipline, we assume that our valuations going to compress over the next five years to a market valuation. Well, we don't have much further to go compared to normal. Uh, and so uh, we do believe that the revenue growth and margin expansion in our companies is going to overwhelm, more than overwhelm, uh, the valuation gap. And I gave you CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, by company, we, we calculate uh, the return we expect over the next five years with that valuation compression built in. Uh, and on that one, it's almost 50% at a compound annual rate. That's how badly these stocks have been treated, even though cures have been approved. You know, interesting to hear you talk about the, the, the valuation side. So that, that, that's, um, that's really useful. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is is on the US election. We can't possibly can't not talk about it, given it's, it's so fast approaching and has, and has um, again, such a bearing on, on, on market sentiments, at least. Um, I wondered if you'd made any changes to your your thinking on the outlook as, as we run up to, to the election. Well, as I always say, um, disruptive innovation solves problems, and we have a lot of problems. <laughs> so, uh, and they're they're going to be expressed, we believe, through margin compression. And so, what's going to happen as prices come down? And you, as you can tell, I'm our conviction that that's going to happen has increased here. Um, as prices come down, uh, companies will look for ways to uh, buffer their margins. And uh, I think AI is, is going to be um, an important solution to that. Uh, we think that the productivity of the average knowledge worker is going to increase fourfold by the end of this decade. Can you imagine doing four times more work in 2030 than you're doing today in the same number of hours? right? Or maybe even fewer hours. Uh, so uh, we think that um, the digitalization of everything we do is going to be a part of that. So what started during or what was turbocharged during the COVID crisis is going to kick in once again with greater force. 
Uh, and it's up to us to find out who are the winners. There's going to be a lot of commoditization in this space. Even software as a service is beginning to run into trouble as large language models usurp some of its role out there. Uh, so um, it's going to be exciting uh, on the one hand for those of us just focused on disruptive innovation. And, and the election itself is a lot of drama. But in the U.S., what uh, is wonderful is there are three arms of government. There's the executive branch, which is what we're talking about here. Uh, there's the legislative branch, and there are some elections there as well. And there is the judicial branch, which when it comes to uh, the digital asset world, some people call crypto asset world, um, is becoming very important. Uh, we've been chasing uh, innovation and talent off U.S. shores because of the SEC and regulators not willing to consider the possibilities. They just want to consolidate their own power. Well, the judicial system is saying, you are out of line, and now we're seeing talent coming back. So n one election is not going to make or break uh, the U.S. I think our founding fathers uh, had, had a great deal to do with that. Um, but there will be a lot of drama, especially in this election season. So it'll be uh, amusing, certainly, to watch uh, the, the drama unfold. Uh, and it will be very interesting to see the result. Yeah, always is. Yeah. Yeah. And Kathy, I've saved a, a bit of time for our kind of standard final question because it's um, it's one that I've, I've I've wanted to ask you and give you a bit more time to to answer. It. And it's it's a question which asks the speaker for their highest conviction area at the moment, and it could be a stock or uh, we've, we've talked about the the genomics and the life science space and a bit a bit already. But I wondered if, if I could push you for maybe one or even two kind of high conviction stocks or areas that you could that you could run us through just to just to close. Sure. Um, well, certainly I have to feature Tesla because it is the it epitomizes the convergence that I discussed about autonomous taxi platforms. Uh, Coinbase uh, is a very high conviction name. It's the number two uh, um, in terms of size, number two portfolio uh, name in the portfolio. Uh, and we do think we're looking for uh, who's going to win the, the, in the digital wallet realm. Um, we learned a lot from WeChat Pay in China, how much uh, in terms of financial services and commerce could take place just within a digital wallet and how a digital wallet will be able to clip just a little bit off of each one of those. Uh, so in the portfolio, you'll find Coinbase coming at it from the crypto space. You'll find Robinhood coming at it, starting from the equity space and understanding how important uh, the user interface is, delighting the consumer. And I know Robinhood just entered uh, the UK, uh, fourth quarter of last year. Uh, and the third one is Block. Uh, Block is the old Square. Many people know it by Square. Square is on the merchant side. Cash App is on the consumer side, and they're coming at this from a two-sided marketplace point of view and a closed ecosystem, uh, and also from a Bitcoin point of view. And Bitcoin alone, Jack Dorsey believes that, and, and so do we, by the way, that this is the first global, digital, distributed, or decentralized, no government oversight, uh, rules-based monetary system in history. And my mentor, Art Laffer, Laffer Curve fame, a monetary scholar also, believes that. He said, I have been looking for this since the U.S. closed the gold window in 1971. So it's a very big idea, and that is why we focus on it so much. Kathy, absolutely fascinating to, to chat to you. Thanks so much for, for coming in. Thanks for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Gordon. Thank you for listening to the Investor Insights Podcast, hosted by Killick & Co. You can get in contact using our podcast email address, investorinsights at killick.com. For more information on any of the topics discussed, or for further details on the services offered by Killick & Co. This podcast is not personal advice. The content is intended for educational purposes only, and is not investment research or a recommendation to buy, or sell any financial instrument or product, or to adopt any investment strategy. 
the value of your investments can rise as well as fall, and you could get back less than you invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The investments referred to in this podcast may not be suitable for all investors, and you should seek advice from a qualified investment advisor. Killick & Co. is authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA.